name is Rebecca Siciliano and I'm the MD at Tiger Recruitment. Um, today, obviously, we're joined by our experts here and um, all of our participants on the call, and we're going to be talking about diversity in the finance industry. Um, now, for everyone uh, that's joining us and, and tuned in for today, please use the Q&A function to ask us any questions um, throughout, and we'll be answering those questions at the end. I'm going to um, give you all an opportunity to sort of, you know, any questions that you want that we perhaps don't get through, um, please do email us at tiger at tiger-recruitment.co.uk. Um, I'm going to start by introducing uh, our experts that are joining us today. Um, so first off, we have Sasha Graham. Um, now, Sasha is CMO and Senior Consultant at Equality Group, which are a DNI consulting firm for technology and asset management companies. She is responsible for developing workshops, internal data collection and industry benchmarking, alongside delivering inclusion and diversity training to businesses. We have Kieran O'Reilly joining us today as well. Hi, Kieran. Um, Kieran is a senior account manager at Book Graham, a DNI consultant, consultancy firm in London. Kieran's expertise lies in practical work based programs that address the underrepresentation of groups within private equity, wealth management, and asset management. He speaks on a range of DNI topics and works with senior leaders to design and implement DNI strategies locally and globally. We are also joined by Kate Delmy. Kate is an HR professional with over 25 years experience, mainly in investment and wealth management. She has worked in both permanent and interim roles where she's really seen the changing views of DNI within the industry as well. She also has experience implementing and supporting DNI initiatives for businesses. And finally, we have Aniqua Rao. Aniqua is an associate at the, in the markets, governance and innovation team at the Alternative Investment Management Association. She focuses on digital assets and data regulation. Aniqua is currently coordinating a number of diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives, including the foundation of AIMA's Career, Careers Network. So there's a big introduction for all of you. I'm going to go straight into our um, questions now. Um, Kate, I'm going to direct our first question to you. Um, so as an HR professional at, at a financial services firm, what, is, what shift have you seen in the attitude, attitude towards DNI over the last 12 months? Yeah, thank you. Um, personally, I think there's been quite a, a sizable shift in the awareness and recognition of diversity and inclusion. I think broadly headlined, it's awareness and it's relevance. And this has been brought about by probably the um, pandemic and then secondly by the George, uh, George Floyd incident in the US last year and all the Black Lives Matter movement. I think, you know, with the pandemic, people have been working from home, they're on VC, you get a chance to have an insight into their home and their personal life that isn't normally seen. There's questions around inclusion that businesses are asking, how can I include my work? Force, how can I make it still relevant for them and why should I be doing that with the lockdown and with all the changes that are being brought about is there a change or are there better coping mechanisms based on your gender your age your social economic group um, or your ethnic background and then with the Black Lives Matter movement I think that it's a bit of, you know, why? Why is this relevant? Why is this situation that happened in the US now relevant in the UK? And how is that relevant to my potentially pan-European business? What do we have to do? Why do we have to do it? What do employees ex expect of us? What do stakeholders expect of us? So with that, I, I do know that there's been quite a lot of um, boardroom training so those that are experts in DNI have done a lot of boardroom training to um, advise and educate boards around diversity and inclusion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's almost one of those things that um, in the past it was a bit easy for, for companies to just hire 
like-minded people or people that were, you know, the, the company or cultural fit. And now it's that understanding that we've, you know, we've got to move away from that and create more opportunities and more, you know, diversion, divert, diversity within the workplace for everyone as well. Um, yeah, so I think that's yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I think businesses have had to think about what is my business strategy? Things can change so quickly. So how can I maintain my competitive edge? And perhaps it's sped up some of the strategic objectives that businesses might have had, you know, their five-year plan. And now it's become, you know, the next two-year plan. How do they facilitate that? They need a higher different types of people um, in order to maintain that, that competitive edge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Kieran, um, you've seen the growing importance of intersection intersectionality um, when you're working with your, your clients. For those of us that don't know too much about that area, can you give us a, a quick overview and um, how it fits into the DNI workplace as well? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, intersectionality is one of those words um, that you know, for those of us in the diversity and inclusion world, and maybe HR tend to use quite quite often. But for many, it's it's not really something that you 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 pay too much attention to. But it, it was coined uh, many years ago by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. That's um, she's a professor in in the US, and and this is when she was doing some research around. Um, race inequality in the justice system there which um but like kate was saying you know these are these are things that we're getting over from states but in that case they were saying that as a black woman being black and a woman were the two different levels of barriers that these that you as a black woman would face in the justice system and the the results were absolutely so when we think of intersectionality i think um kimberly crenshaw uses the phrase it's really a metaphor and it's it's really the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage compound themselves together um so you can think of race anti-racism you can think of gender disability even in the uk we talk quite a lot about sort of um you know social categorizations or protected characteristics so we talk about sexual orientation or lgbtq plus or you know different ways of describing it all of those things could be a barrier but for one person so they could be experienced multiple levels of it so really in the workplace the way we tend to look at it is it is use the sort of the metaphor as a kind of prism and it's a way to understand certain kinds of problems so race may be a problem gender may be a problem disability may be a problem that people experience in either getting into work or progressing in work so really intersectionality is a prism to look at those problems collectively and understand how you can deal with them because if you imagine if you focus on right we're going to do everything we can to um, improve gender equality in the organization but then you focus on that you might be forgetting other aspects of someone's experience um, so really it's a way just to look at and frame a range of problems that could be happening at the same time for one person yeah excellent and Anika what are the main challenges that the members of AIMA have um, experienced in improving their DNI practices? Thanks, Rebecca, and hi, everyone. Um, I'd say the challenges that investment managers face really varies according to factors such as the size and location of the firm. Um, but I think there are um, a couple of um, key difficulties that you know firms kind of across the board um, face. Um, these are really understanding how to approach uh, improvements in the first place to ensure that developments are really meaningful um, and then securing buy-in from senior leaders um, to really achieve that sustainability. Um, so firms really need to understand their employees and the firm's culture, essentially their starting point um, in order to understand um, how to kind of set meaningful goals um, and make progress. And that can be really difficult um, to form a representative picture of the makeup of the firm, um, understand how employees are moving through the firm and um, by title and really pinpoint uh, areas for improvement. If firms aren't able to accumulate adequate DNI data um, from their employees, um, and employees must opt into sharing this data um, and they might not feel comfortable disclosing um, such sensitive personal data. Um, and also, inclusion is a you know, qualitative, qualitative concept by nature. Um, so you can't really, really uh, measure that. Um, so I'd say the difficulty in data collection um, and benchmark strategies can be a challenge, um, but there are ways to tackle this. Um, and while data is useful to have, um, one member said, you know, what gets measured gets done. 
um, it is by no means um, a barrier to firms implementing DNI and initiatives um, and frameworks. Um, and then secondly, I think buy-in from senior management and the executive while improving um, can still be difficult. Um, and that is a really uh, important driver of long-term success. Yeah, excellent. I couldn't agree with your point on reporting more because that, we've seen a big increase in that from our clients that are now looking for that data. But it is that balancing act where you know we don't want to force people just to disclose that information if they don't want to. So that's I guess one of the one of the limitations and the things that that you know can be holding us back a little bit at the moment as well. Um, Sasha, on to on to you now as well. What are the um, current issues that you're seeing among your clients looking to adopt new DNI policies? Thanks, Rebecca. Well, I think, again, some of the challenges, actually, I think Inco covered them quite well, and that's what you see across the industry and across the organisations. I would say one of those bigger challenges is actually for companies to understand that diversity and inclusion is um, it's something that can really help with value creation, but there is because there is still like a really big misconception about the fact that um, somehow it takes away from that, and there's still that fear around lowering the standards and you know what does it actually mean? And again, like understanding the context for organisations because um, you know we're facing it's such a such a complex topic and people have so many different opinions and ideas about it so reconciling those within a group of people is really um, challenging I would say ESG has been one of the key factors and actually one of the most helpful factors specifically in the financial industry yeah to help to drive this conversation because that s with within ESG, you know, this is DNI is basically the foundations of that. And then it spills over into that and governance. And actually having the pressure the pressure on financial companies from a variety of stakeholders to adhere to that means um, that this conversation is getting sort of like pushed uh, forward. Yeah, definitely. So I think through all of your comments there, we've effectively sort of covered what the current state of play is. Um, if we can now sort of look a little bit more at effective DNI practices for um, financial services firms. So um, Sasha, I'm going to go back to you on, on this one again. Um, what are some of the best examples that you've seen of um, DNI policies? So when it comes to um, policies and practices, I think. Again, like when you start thinking about it, uh, I would go back to what Aniko said, and um, that that piece of on inclusion is is fundamentally the key because you can implement as many policies as you like, um, but if if there isn't a culture where people actually can take advantages of those policies, it's not really going to be beneficial to anyone. Um, I would say in some of the key players in the industry. So for example, if you look at that Accent International, they have a variety of great policies, um, you know, and they're really pushing to expand them. And what I'm talking about is, you know, diversifying their recruitment and making sure that they're reaching out to a variety of networks. And again, they've done that quite localized because they're spread across the world. So like in the US, they have certain partners that they partner with certain networks, similarly in Europe. Um, then when it comes to paternal leave, they have, again, support um, on that. They've been really working on the language of it as well, just to stay away from, um, you know, again, like some of the gendered language when it comes to the topic and just opening up for, um, you know, single sex couples and, you know, people who are adopting and etc. So making sure that everybody feels welcome and they're taking, having the opportunity actually taking advantage of um you know the parental leave because i think parental leave is one of the key challenges in the industry overall um because even organize again like there's so many who don't take it especially especially men mm -hmm. um and um again in another well, another example, I would say, of great practices that influences um, culture is, um, I've 
we've seen that with Shilavik, which is um, like a Swedish fund, and they the very explicit and supportive communication from the leadership from the top really has a positive impact on um, that psychological safety. It really opened up the conversation for people through feedback uh, and kind of explore the topic together, you know, understanding exactly what, what does that mean in the context for their organization and what are the best policies for them uh, to implement um, to support everybody in that term. Yeah, excellent. Um, and I think, again, it's such an interesting topic on the paternity leave and just looking at, if I'm thinking about some of the clients that we work with, I know that it might be common that we'd have, um, say a father taking paternity leave and feeling that they're able to do so because their manager has done the same thing. So it just kind of opens yeah. up if you're seeing that, um, if you're seeing that happening from the top, there's a little bit more confidence in other people following up and, and, and not feeling like it's just something that's offered but not encouraged. Um, it makes a big difference as well, as well on that side. Um, Kate, how can HR uh, professionals look that are looking at introducing DNI policies um, best get, best get buy-in from the leaders within the business? Okay, so for me, I found um, a six-step method works quite effectively, of which the buy-in or the presentation to um, the business leaders is, is part of that. So the, the starting point is your data um, collection. You need to know who you've got working for you. And obviously self-service is uh, on an HR system is the most effective way of doing that. But failing that survey monkey in it and an Excel spreadsheet can work um, equally well depending on your, your business structure. Um, from there, then you need to do the second step, data analysis. What do you have? And you know, is there is there the right blend for your business, which kind of ties into part three, which is, you know, what um, what is your strategy and why do you need to to change it? Um, is there a need actually? Because each business is different. You know, there is no one size fits all. I think that's what you were saying before, Sasha. There's not one size or one solution that's right for every business. So um, you need to have a look at what your strategy is going forward and do you have the right blend of people? If you're trying to, you know, um, go after the female divorcee market, you're not going to do that by presenting a fund manager between the ages of 35 and 50 as a man. They're less likely to be successful than having a woman in place or if you're trying to build out your business in Nigeria having perhaps, um, I don't know, a, a Canadian going into the Nigerian market who's had nothing to do with Africa before wouldn't necessarily be the appropriate person. So that analysis piece is actually um, very important in identifying the need to change. Um, and, and, and also I think recognition that a token person isn't enough to represent change one person of one type, one woman, one disabled person, one of anything doesn't enable change or one, particularly in financial services, particularly over the last few years, you've seen quite a change in the socioeconomic type of person that's, that's in there. All used to be, you know, the, the sorry people and now actually you've got some very good um, Southeast London um, people in, in the city. And they bring a different, um, a different characteristic to the business. So, you know, you really have to have a look at, at what blend of people you need to enable change. One person from Tower Hamlets in a business of people who have um, perhaps studied at Oxford or Cambridge isn't going to enable that thought change. So you need to have a collection to make it meaningful, plus education of your existing workforce then really, in order to win over your business leaders, your ex-co, you need to put a pound sign on it. There needs to be a financial um, incentive for them to diversify um, together with the how. So you put the pound sign on it for the why, and then you need to demonstrate the how. 
and the implementation is really um, is probably actually the most difficult aspect because it's kind of easy to get your data and to say, yeah, yeah, we need to do this. And that all sounds like a good idea. But you need, um, I think, a champion from within the business. It shouldn't be driven by HR. HR should support it. Otherwise, it's just another HR initiative. Oh, it's HR going on again. We know nobody ever reads our emails, you know. So how do we enable um, the business to actually grow in the right way? doesn't matter who gets credit for it, right? It's about enabling. So if you can find some champions from within the business to lead it, sorry, business calls. Um, <laughs> uh, if you can find a champion from within the business to lead, or a few actually with HR supporting and guiding and giving some ideas and suggestions, that's always the most effective. But also having a two to three year plan, you know, what are the things that we could do to enable this and always having a six month plan in advance because it's so easy for day-to-day -day business just to take over these sorts of initiatives. You know, something, I don't know, it's evaluations or it's end of year, it's end of tax year, it's, you know, bonus time, that there's something that happens that challenges the proactive aspects of, of implementation. So I think having that always having a six month lead on activities, whether it's, you know, um, doing something for Black Awareness Week or, um, I don't know, hot cross buns or samosas at Diwali or, or, or something. Food is such a good buy-in for people. Mm. Or having, um, you know, one business I was at, we had a um, disabled Paralympic doing a lunch, lunch and learn kind of thing. It was so inspiring. Um, you, you don't often see disabled people, physically disabled people in the city. So, you know, it, it, it's quite different. Um, and the other things that I think, are, um, you know, diversity is, is so different. It is so different in terms of, you know, a, if we're looking at tokenism, a black third generation Englishman thinks quite differently to, you know, a black Jamaican or a black Nigerian or, or anyone, you know, it, it's how these cultures and these differences are represented. It's not just skin color. Um, yeah. So, you know, when there's an event, but when there's a national day, you know, something, I don't know, um, Australia day, um, five things you don't know about Australia get it generated from within the business, create the interest from within the business. And I think that brings about when you've got that diversity and you do activities like that, it actually brings about inclusion. I think that those are, are quite key. Those are the six key methodologies that I would um, bring about to inspire managers and leadership teams to have a DNI policy. Yeah. Just to add to, sorry, um, just add to Kate's point around, um, you know, linking firm diversity targets with executive pay um, to really help get buy-in from leaders. We're also seeing some firms um, go further and link targets to non-executive senior managers' pay. Um, and, you know, just for some context, in the UK's uh, Treasury's uh, annual review of the Women in Finance Charter this year, it was shared that 49% uh, of charter signatories um, found that link to be effective and are pushing for diversity objectives um, to be part of performance reviews. Um, so that's also kind of a, a tangible um, way to get by in. Yeah. I think the real difficulty in financial services though is that everyone's getting on the bandwagon and there just aren't that many people, you have to remember, you still have to populate your, your teams with those that are skilled to do the job. You can put some training plans in place, but you still need to hire the best person for the job. And the best person doesn't necessarily fit in with your DNI philosophy. So long as you've got, you know, the, the other aspect of DNI is having the HR practices to support it. So if you're recruiting someone new to a team, 
see, well, what's the team's strategy? Is it the same as it was five years from plan? Does it have the right mix of people to enable that plan to meet the business strategy? And if you're looking for a woman or, I don't know, any one of the ethnic variations, they aren't there. So then you have to go back and think, well, how do, how do we get there? And sometimes it's growing your own. So it's, you know, and the uh, using your, um, what to call it, uh, apprenticeship tax levy, you know, and, and bringing in apprentices and growing your own people, your own diversity, um, so that over years, you have that employee population. If you've got your inclusion piece right, then they'll stay with you. Yeah, definitely. I think th that traineeship idea and, and the idea of, you know, bringing that talent through, I think is such an important thing because that's what's lacking at the moment, isn't it? And that's where it's, it's more difficult to get that diversity into the sector. Um, Anika, I'm going to go to you now just uh, to talk a little bit more about a paper that AMA released. So the um, alternatives, which outlined 45 different actions that hedge funds could take to improve diversity. Um, how applicable do you think this is for other organisations in the finance sector as well, regardless of you know, size or structure and things like that? Oh, completely applicable. Um, you know, depending on their size and structure, financial services firms um, will approach DNI differently um, and each can be equally as effective. Um, the core point really being, you know, firms have to approach DNI in a way that makes sense um, and works for their firm. Um, so, for example, there are only six individuals in your organisation, um, then following an approach based on employee uh, DNI metrics is probably less appropriate and effective than a firm that, say, has 500 uh, employees. Um, and so that really framed the basis of our paper. Um, as a trade association, most of our members are smaller or next generation hedge fund managers. Um, and these often don't have dedicated um, DNI or large HR, uh, HR teams. Um, so we wish to share um, a number of ways that firms of different sizes can improve their DNI. Um, and the action is touched on uh, many of the different levels where DNI can be incorporated. Um, so from embedding a healthy culture um, to recruitment, uh, retention, promotion, um, and in external uh, relationships. Um, so, you know, for example, something as small as removing names and addresses from applications, um, using gender neutral language, as Sasha mentioned, um, marking holidays marked by different communities to really um, encourage a culture of um, celebration and learning, or even inviting your um, more junior colleagues to attend meetings of senior leaders um, and learn from conversations that they may not ordinarily um, be privy to and can be effective. Um, you know, it's okay to be starting off from somewhere different to another firm, um, but the key thing is just to start. Um, and our expectation wasn't that firms will incorporate all 45 action points, but hope that it prompts ideas of what is possible um, and something might resonate with firms individually. Um, and, you know, when considering different policies and initiatives, do speak to peers and learn from one another. Um, when we launched the AIMA Careers Network at the start of the lockdown to help individuals um, across the industry with their professional development, um, as well as valuing the ability to meet and learn from a range of professionals, um, firms found it a really useful place to discuss, plan d &I initiatives and share ways that they were educating and supporting their employees. Um, for example, in the wake of the pandemic and George Floyd's murder. Um, so do be open to those conversations. And, you know, being here today is a great start. Um, but, um, you know, a collective effort is definitely um, the way to go. Yeah. And having a look at that aim of paper, I think it's fantastic for businesses that don't really know where to start on this. Like, everyone can take something from that. It's, it's so detailed in, in how companies can take a really pragmatic approach to everything too. Um, yeah, I was so impressed looking at that. Um, and Kieran, for you, um, how can firms choose to take the, the right action um, or policy at the right time? That's a really good question. I think it's one of those ones that when people suddenly start on the journey go, oh my goodness, it's so complicated. Well, I don't know what to do and maybe I'll come back to it. So, you know, like, <clears throat> as Eddie said, you know, you 45, you know, there's 45 things you could look at. You could just pick one if you wanted to start. But my advice is always to do this. 
what do you think you want to achieve? So you start there and then stop, take a step back and say, okay, if I do do this, what is the impact I want to have and what's the benefit? And then get an idea of what that looks like and what that, that advantage is going to be. And then just pause a little bit further and think, if I was to do that, who else could benefit from this? And you might find, because we're all people, <laughs> that one, that's, one, one, one practice is good for one group. It's actually good for others as well in many different ways. So in fact, you could be getting lots of different benefits from taking one action if you just step back and have a think about it. If, you, if you're not sure what to do, talk to your colleagues, talk to your, talk to your staff. Um, get those different views of it and say, look, we really want to get on with this because we know it's important, but you know, we're, we're starting or we're, we're going to do something new. What do you think? Get those diversity of thoughts and views because people's lived experiences as well as their professional experiences will help you shape it and you do it together. And I think once you've got that feeling is then from a business point of view to pick what's really going to be right is have a look at it at different levels of, of benefit and by that what I mean is what benefit will the organization get from this what benefit will our teams get from doing this and what benefits will those individuals get from it and I know in the sort of P&L sectors there's a fourth level as well will this benefit our clients or will this benefit my uh, going into market so you suddenly realize if you put that framework around it you could do one thing and it has multiple levels of benefit and if it creates a foundation for the next step all the better because you just keep moving forward. I'll give you an example of one. I think we were talking about a P firm in, um, in, in North America and they were purchasing into, into their businesses and they wanted an index, a DNI type of index. Now, of course, that's really complicated because of many indexes and there's no common standard. There's no sort of you know, credit rating that really works on what does DNI look like in that organization. You can look at the website and it might sound good, but what's really going on underneath that? So when they were looking at, we helped craft a number of questions, but the reason there is no common index is because everyone sees things differently. And what they wanted to do was have a look at what those differences were and work out how they could pay checks forward to make changes in those organizations. And that was just one step. And that's what they were doing, taking a step back. What benefit can it be for everyone else? And at what levels can we make this work and leverage it effectively? So once you go through that process, what's right for right now will bubble up to the surface and you'll, you'll get a really good feel for what you can go with. Yeah. Excellent. Does anyone have anything else to add on that? Yeah, oh, I... oh, sorry. Go on. No, no, Sasha, go ahead. I'll jump in. After. No, I just, as Kieran mentioned uh, indexes, I just wanted to say that uh, we're one of those organizations who like doing indexes. Um, and we've developed one specifically, actually. Um, so we, the index, we've developed an index with our academic team because we work, we've got like a head of research who um, works specifically in, in prejudice and a few other behavioral psychologists. And we've kind of pulled together a um, met metrics that get across six, six different categories with four, four, five different bullet points. And then we scored only on publicly available information for that website, anything else that they put out there. Um, there are over 300 VC and PE firms, and then we came up with, with the top 20. And that sparked such an interesting conversation in the sense that you, I mean, you got a variety of range of you know, emotional responses. Um, but it was really interesting in, um, I would just say like the benefit of doing that was to allowing the companies to see a reflection of themselves. Because, um, you know, how, I mean, we talked about it, that's one of the, um, key topics that companies keep bringing is the fact that, well, they're trying to attract diverse talent, they're trying to attract diverse talent. And where we're saying, well, if you want to attract diverse talent, these are the things you need to kind of clearly communicate because that's what diverse talent is attracted to and that's how they know they're going to be safe. Um, and that just proved to be such a helpful and really interesting exercise for, you know, just based on that external perception, because as you rightly said, Karen, that you know you, you don't know exactly what's going on inside of the organization. So we have found that um, I think most companies are, um, you know, there's actually more the ones who are more public about it are the ones who actually do have um, systems in place, um, and the one who the ones who do very little communicate even less. So especially within the context of the last year, because there has been so much backlash um, from just employees and organizations 
um, against tokenistic statements from leadership with regards to DNI. Yeah, and Aniko, what were you going to say as well? Um, yeah, so I was just going to say, as well as, you know, different size um, firms, there's also kind of a distinction between sell side approaches and buy side approaches. Um, you know, particularly for the buy side, there isn't really a particular or direct route into the industry or, you know, into the hedge fund industry, for example, um, like there may be for law or consulting or banking that have, you know, more uh, graduate schemes in place or a greater presence at university. Um, and, you know, most in individuals so begin their careers at the sell side and then move across into the buy side. Um, so, you know, where many sectors can maybe address d &I at the um, entry stage to support the di uh, diverse pipeline, um, that's less easy for buy side firms. Um, but, you know, there are still ways to increase visibility um, and working with organizations such as SEO um, or initiatives such as Investment 2020, um, that really work with students and arrange apprenticeships um, or trainee schemes, for example, is a good way. Um, and maybe where there isn't the capacity to host students at your firm physically, um, then offering virtual internships um, outside of the pandemic is a good too. Um, so there's one called Forage, um, and that's an increasingly popular platform, um, not being sponsored, um, but that can help, you know, with arranging these um, from an operational and technology perspective. I've actually completed a number of schemes from there myself and find it to be a useful resource. Um, so something also to look into. Excellent. No, that's really good. Um, a couple of people have also asked if we can um, publish a link to the AIMA paper. Um, just to let you all know, we'll share that with um, all the core participants afterwards as well for anyone that does want to have a look at that as well. Um, now, I guess looking further at, you know, the responsibility for the wider business community. Um, Sasha, what are your clients um, taking into account with, with d &I when looking at their investment decisions? Um, like, is, that, is it something that they're sort of thinking about with investment opportunities? I think they do. I mean, again, like it depends um, who you work with. And I think there are organizations in a variety of spectrums in the sense those who are really looking at their portfolios and what the investment is like and how they're diversifying their pipeline and those who are just not interested at all. Um, and still, it's I'd say it's, it's a really big battle, especially within venture capital, where they're you know it's all about serendipity, it's all about pattern recognition. Why are you bringing this DNI conversation? Um, so again, I think this is just a, like a really big educational piece uh, because there has been so much, there has been quite a lot of research done again, like in some really good stats in terms of saying that I, you know again and again diversity inclusion they they will add value they will um you know they will help your business grow it's it's challenging because you know you have to think differently and you have to apply different things but you know it is possible because and then you stay away from this chicken and egg situation where like oh well this is just what the industry is like oh, well, but you're not doing anything to change the industry so you kind of get stuck in this virtual conversation um so i think I think there is, I think there's a variety, I have seen a variety of initiatives and again, quite a lot of them is coming from um, ESG focused um, investment organizations who are really trying to work on pushing um, companies to diversify their portfolios. And I think, I think just again, starting with literally that data gathering process that Kate mentioned, like number one, just, you know, understand where you are, like, you know, look and look at the numbers, look at where you're at because that will give you an understanding of um, it, well, where you are at and then think what you want to achieve and then go, go with that. So, and you know, it has been encouraging working with a few clients who have, you know, have, you know shared some positive case studies in the sense that, you know, some of the founders ch chose um, and agreed to work with the investment team because they had that gender representation because they felt comfortable because in the meeting room they were not they didn't feel like they were the minority or they were just um, you know their voice wasn't heard or they were just not connecting um, as easily so it shows that 
you if you do want to have diversity you you can and you know it can be positive for investment you just you need to start thinking differently and applying practices that would help you to diversify your portfolio yeah excellent um and and Anika, I'm sorry i've jumped ahead now to sort of looking at the responsibility in the wider um community as well so Anika, if we're sort of um directing this to you now um, so DNI has become a you know big internal fo focus for many hedge funds over the past twelve months. Has this become a consideration for your members when they're looking at um, making you know investments? Sure. Um, so I think the events of the past year has led investors um, and investment managers to be more alert to the yes and ESG um, and consider DNI in their investment decisions. Um, not only are investors and allocators seeking managers um, with more diverse teams, um, recognizing that greater diversity of thought leads to more effective decision making, um, but in their due diligence, they're also asking how managers implement uh, ESG and DNI um, in the firm's investment activities and asking for more evidence. Um, and allocators and investors are increasingly asking managers directly about their DNI policies and how they incorporate uh, DNI in investment decisions, um, as opposed to asking um, on an anonymized basis um, through consultants. Um, and you know, in line with this, sorry to push another AIMA publication, but we have created a DNI due diligence questionnaire with um, market researcher Auburn Partners. Um, to assist investors and fund managers um, with this. And, you know, the, DNA, uh, the GDQ um, enables managers to answer questions um, and provide context to, um, for example, their family-friendly policies, um, staff conduct, um, diversity uh, investment portfolio companies. Um, and we've tiered these um, into basic and enhanced to make it accessible again to smaller and larger managers. Um, but in March, according to Alborn, um, around 270 managers of varying sizes um, across the globe had completed the DDQ um, for around 1,700 funds. Um, so definitely seeing some pick up there. Um, yeah. the investors are at different stages um, and placing a diff uh, different emphasis on the different parts um, of DNI and the AMA Alborn DDQ. Um, you know, there's a shared understanding that incorporating DNI in investment decisions um, isn't sacrificing performance. Um, so some have a formalized approach and carve dedicated pools of capital um, for diverse or emerging managers. Um, a number of investors, particularly uh, in North America, are also allocating more capital to social causes um, and minority and women owned businesses. Um, and some managers are also carving out specific DNI funds um, that are focused on companies that demonstrate good DNI themselves um, or generate a positive um, economic or social impact through, um, for example, uh, access to technology, uh, healthcare, um, and financial products. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I haven't heard of that sort of concept of people having their dedicated DNI funds. So I think that's a really interesting idea as well. Um, and Kieran, can you talk more about financial services firms and, and their responsibility for, for promoting um, DNI within the wider business community? Yeah, I think there's, there's this this idea. I remember years and years ago that when we worked on um, sort of DNI or different title type programs, that it was kind of a secret. It was a USP. So how we're going to get the talent? We better not share it. Um, but of course, that in many cases led to what we often call the revolving door of diversity, because they'd got a great idea and a policy, but the actual culture wasn't really really doing too well so people with great backgrounds and talent would come in and then leave um, because it just wasn't somewhere they felt they could be themselves so it was always a bit of a problem but that's changing and I think the the responsibility now is that as a sector you know you can get so much shared information you can learn from peers you can get so much but that's really about sustaining that momentum and when you sustain that men momentum and if it's always going to be talked about you create habitual norms and that is where you start to accept differences in a much more um, inclusive way and it's not about the difference it's about the talent it's about those areas but we've got challenges to face organizations have opportunities to gain but by talking collectively of a sector, what one organization is doing is sometimes sharing it open source almost with what they're doing about attracting and retaining. We've heard about apprenticeships and so many other ways of working that if everybody keeps talking about it and we keep sharing the practical, not just the words, but the actions, 
people don't work out what they can do. And when you find out actually it's not that complex and you can just keep doing it, it's the importance now for the sector to keep that momentum because without it, we won't sustain some of those changes. And you end up with a really um, quite widespread out field. You'll have those who are very, very good at creating incredible workforces, incredible cultures who will be really successful and those who are really struggling to keep up with that. And it affects reputation. I mean, we're talking about ESG, but you know, people are looking at you now from an investment point of view in ways that was never looked at before and asking questions that, you know, was just one of those things you thought you put on a due diligence form and never ever see again. It's actually what we're asking for. It's what we're talking about and it's making a difference. And that is way, one of the ways that we can keep sustaining momentum. And I think it's really critical. And there's so much stuff coming from outside the sectors as well. So, you know, bringing in best practice and then sharing it. And I think that is a really, really powerful way. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a responsibility for us all. Yeah, excellent. Um, anyone else got anything to add on that area as well? I was just going to add that, you know, as well as being, you know, the right thing to do from a social perspective and business wise, um, DI is also becoming more of a regulatory focus, um, at least from the UK. Um, so uh, the senior managers and certification regime, which focuses on firms establishing healthy and purposeful um, cultures, effective governance, um, and greater uh, individual accountability. Um, is one example where that has, uh, that focus has been put into practice. Um, but also earlier this year, the FCA explicitly stated um, that DNI is a uh, DNI are regulatory issues, um, and that as part of its work on wholesale wholesale banking culture, um, it will be adding a sixth uh, conduct question to help focus the minds of senior managers um, on conduct risk. Um, so questions like, is your management team diverse enough to provide? Uh, adequate challenge? Um, do you create the right environment um, in which people of all backgrounds can speak up? Um, so yeah, we are seeing that kind of increase from the regulators um, as well. Yeah, and uh, I would say, Anika, that actually the more and more that those questions are asked, the more responsibility HR has to embed that kind of best practice and, and good behaviour in businesses rather than it being oh my God, we've got this questionnaire, quick, let's fill in something, let's create something that sounds good. There's only so much of that you can do. And I think the expectation is there's a cultural shift among the wider community about DNI and, and awareness. There's actually a requirement for businesses to make it genuine and authentic as well. Yeah. Can I, I just would add, I think, <clears throat> to Kate and Anik's point is that, <clears throat> you know, with the FCA uh, in the UK, you know, you're going to, there's a compliance element to it, but it is driving best practice. But there's also the opportunity for people to speak out and, and hold themselves to account. And we're, we're seeing things like BlackRock, you know, when earlier this year, when they're saying their, their credit facility, you know, they're saying to their lenders, if we don't achieve our diversity targets, we'll pay you more. Now, whether how how effective that is and you know blackrock being the size that it is maybe it's lenders just agreed anyway but you know there is a point that they're actually having a conversation to hold themselves to account a different way so those conversations are, are coming about you know organizationals taking an, an approach but also like from the fca approach there's also a requirement to look at it from a regulatory point of view so it's, it's becoming a different way of of not only just doing something that you're being asked to do in the uk say by the fca but also what you want to do and how you speak to the market so the conversations are changing, but they're coming from, you know, similar ideals and hopefully it, it is driving change. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, look at looking at sort of overcoming um, the barriers to change. Um, Kate, what should an inclusive company culture look like within a financial services firm? Do you know what? I, I think the inclusion comes from um, when everything appears normal. So Inclusion, diversity is the normalization of those concepts within your business where your culture generates um, an awareness and an education, a, a continuous improvement process of um, diversity and inclusion. So some of the things that I talked about before with your CEO sending out, you know, today is Eid, so happy Eid to all of our Muslim employees or, you know, it's um, hot cross buns in the kitchen, it's, it's Easter. It, um, it's that sort of normalization. It's getting your um, managers, your hiring managers to go, okay, HR, I'm looking for, um, you know, a new fund manager, but I have already done the analysis of the team and I think this would work and these are the reasons why, being proactive in that. 
It's about looking at, you know, some big meetings that are taking place going, okay, so we have it next week. What are the religious or cultural holidays that may impact the attendance of key people to that meeting? Okay, well, let's move it. So just having always a mindset of inclusion and that normalization of activity, that's what makes it successful. That's what a good company looks like. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Sasha, what considerations should be taken into account when a financial, fir a financial services firm wants to introduce internal DNI education? I think I'd go back to the original point uh, of the fact that you know data and kind of understanding where the firm is and exactly what they need to focus on because it's, it should be like any other training right you want to train your company on sales you'll you're going to find a provider and you're going to structure the conversation or in the way that would be relevant to your team right this is the context this is the market this is the target audience these are the concepts that you need to understand so it should be really treated like any other um, business priority really um, I would say that there has been an incredible hyper focus on unconscious bias and everybody's doing unconscious bias training. But in reality, what you'll find is that um, it doesn't really drive that much result in the sense that people kind of become a bit more aware of the topic and they know that they have unconscious biases. But there's been a few studies that found it uh, actually it led to some doing unconscious bias training led to some controversial results. As in this, it makes people think, well, I've done unconscious bias training. I don't have bias anymore. It doesn't necessarily have an impact on behavior. And again, that comes back to the point that Kate made. Implementation is the hardest thing because we're talking about behavior change. Like you're talking about people really challenging their the way they relate to each other, the way they talk to each other. And you have to set it in the, again, in the psychologically safe way where they don't feel like they can't express themselves and they don't feel um, discriminated against or you know, their experience is minimized. So you kind of have to create this platform of people just feeling comfortable and people comfortable being themselves. Um, and the effectively the education needs to reflect that. I would say getting some of the best, uh, I kind of like what we do with our clients in terms of workshops and education, because we have we have a certain curriculum, but then we adapt it. We, we do quite a lot of work with the organization prior to any educational workshops to kind of understand where they're at, what do they need to focus, what, what are the areas most problematic, and then we adapt it um, to them. Because in, in you do find a variety of things in the organization. So some of them find the conversation about um, ethnicity and race very challenging. Um, others it's gender, or others is just relationship between senior and manager, um, you know, senior and junior. So, so you kind of try to make it as specific as possible. I would say whatever training you do, just make it as specific and as relevant as possible and use best examples rather than keeping it abstract. Um, and really get people to get people to think because very often we throw quite a lot of information at people and they kind of go like, okay, there's so many things, so many concepts, and new terminology that I have to understand. It doesn't really give them a room of, to reflect and understand actually what they think about it. Again, coming back to unconscious bias, you know, bias not all bias is unconscious. We all have quite a lot of very conscious bias and we behave on it. Um, but a lot of the time people don't necessarily voice their biases. And a lot of the time it is due to lack of knowledge or kind of understanding a few things. So actually creating a platform where people can talk to each other about these things and have more clarity. Um, that's kind of what we seem the most useful really. Yeah. Sorry about that. I had a um, drop my mouse and um, managed to get a phone call through at the same time. Um, so sorry to take away from the, the important things you were saying, um, Sasha. Um, but yeah, definitely sort of making that training, training relevant. And I think where we are changing behaviours, it's about that repetition as well. And it's not just one um, training session. It's just you know, repetition to reinforce the behaviours. Yeah, and again, like I think you have to understand that this is a journey. Like nobody, like there's literally no one who's 
like, oh, I've done the training. I don't have any bias anymore. I know everything. Like, again, this is such a, such a vast topic. topic. You can look at so many different things, look at it from so many different angles. Gosh, these debates, like you see people going, no, this is the moral thing. This is the right thing to do. You have, you have to do it to, no, like I will only subscribe to this if I see that, um, you know, business value. From a uh, wide range. Okay. Sorry, um, from, from an HR perspective and looking at the, the training aspects, I think the most effective training to bring about um, change is modular training and having something linked and having action plans to that. So what that means is having a one hour lunch and learn with um, on unbiased you know, um, thought processes or unbiased decision making um, or inclusion just a one thing and then say okay based on this what are you going to do differently just give me one thing and say it out loud around the table and how are you going to do it not just well I'll think differently now but how will you implement that thinking how how are you going to do that you know I'm going to organize my diary differently so I have one hour to call all of my team every week and say how are you going you know as part of the inclusion or it's you know whatever however you need to include people based on the, your your team makeup so it, it's having those specific action points tied into training and the training being a bit of training you know five minute refresh and say we are following on from that in this way because this will develop you further and you know with your thoughts and your activities and the improvements to the business as such so I think the training in those aspects, that's the responsibility of HR. It's part of all of this to make sure that training is effective. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you're looking at you as well, so you've got members that are loca located all over the world. Um, how do different firms in different regions approach diversity and what considerations should, should those types of firms take into, take into account? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, individuals that would be considered a minority or having protected characteristics in one region um, may not be in another. Um, so when firms are considering uh, the DNI approach or setting goals and policies, um, it's important um, to consider the context of different regions um, uh, that they operate in um, and the cultural sensitivities. You know, a blanket um, approach can't be taken you know, further research and understanding is required to understand um, why representation of X group is not as high in one jurisdiction um, compared to another, um, and then take care to simply, um, to not simply transfer policies um, or ideals across borders. Um, and, you know, as with, as with differently uh, sized firms, offices in different regions will be starting from different points. Um, so for example, time scales may need to be amended for certain goals, if the goal is considered appropriate. Um, approaches may also need to be tailored. Um, for example, it might be easier to, um, or more common to collect diversity data on employees um, in one region um, than it is in another. Um, and different jurisdictions also operate under different employment um, or discrimination laws, for example. Um, so these should also be taken into consideration. Yeah, excellent. And um, finally, Kieran, how important is allyship within financial services and how can this be fostered? Uh, simply put, it's critical um, because often the major group can be allies and, you know, they are agents for change. So it's critical that those those allies are in place, but not just from, you know, the statement of being an ally, but actually the actions to take to be an ally, active allyship. And, and that's where change happens because those allies will often sit in different parts of an organization where underrepresented groups may not. Um, so they can be a voice for that, but role model behavior, they can go and find out change. And I think what's really important with allyship is that those allies are able to speak confidently and comfortably about the areas that they are going for, because in many ways, they can make it easier for others to have conversations about areas they don't feel comfortable about. And it's by having these conversations, by bringing things to the fore, that people start to see ways to improve situations for everybody. So I think allyship is very, very critical. And in many organisations, you can have an allyship that you are an ally to many different groups and not just one. And in, in, in that, you can start to see people understanding what differences are 
working on an empathy level and putting um, change in place. Excellent. Um, it, it, sorry, was there something else to add there as well? So just quickly, I think also in terms of allyship, also supporting those individuals that put themselves forward um, to lead or take part in DNI initiatives. I've spoken to many individuals, um, particularly those in more middle level um, or junior roles. And, you know, they say that they're fearful that they'll be regarded as the DNI person um, or that, you know, that would discredit their performance and their day to day work. Um, so as part of that, you know, championing those who are championing others um, is also allyship. Excellent. We've whizzed through this hour. I can't believe it's gone so quickly. Um, but I'm just going to ask you all for a very quick sort of um, final thought on what your one bit of advice would be for financial services firms looking to improve their DNI. So I'll start with you, Sasha. I, to be quite honest with you, I would just really encourage people to start thinking, just reflect and understand where they are at and what they honestly think on the topic um, and really take it from that. Yeah, excellent. And Kieran? Uh, mine is listen to your workforce, demonstrate understanding, take action, talk about it, repeat. Excellent. And Anika? Um, I would say be bold. You know, there's a lot to do um, to essentially unwind years of systemic prejudice and discrimination. Um, but every conversation or initiative is a step forward. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be a formal policy to make a difference. Um, Often it's the informal everyday interactions um, that create the most impact. Excellent. And finally to you, Kate. If you is purpose. If you have a really clear purpose for wanting to enhance your DNI initiatives, that will drive every activity that you do going forward. Perfect. Excellent. Um, thank you so much to our experts for joining us today. This has been such an insightful conversation. I feel really confident that our clients who have tuned in will have really practical tips that they can take away and really put into practice within their businesses as well. Um, so again, for everyone that's joined us, thank you. Please, if you do have any follow-up questions, direct them on through. We will um, share a copy of that AIMA paper. And if there is any other information that you'd like, do let us know. Thanks, everyone.